Welcome to Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government, law, and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. Federal Judge Eileen Cannon struck again this week with an opinion denying the Department of Justice's measured motion for a stay of her previous ruling that permitted Donald Trump, a special master, to sift through the documents seized at Mar-a-Lago, not just for attorney-client, but also for executive privilege. The latest blow strained the imagination of commentators to come up with ever more extravagant words for terrible. The department promptly brought a motion in the Court of Appeals for an emergency stay along the same narrow lines, asking just to be able to use about 100 classified documents seized from Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. If the DOJ's aim was tight in the Mar-a-Lago matter, it was scattershot for the continuing investigation, or investigations, into events on and around January 6th. The pot shots at DOJ for not investigating with sufficient vigor seemed forgotten, as we learned about activity involving Mark Meadows, Jeff Clark, the Save America PAC, and others, leaving no doubt that DOJ is casting a wide investigative net. Meanwhile, the January 6th committee has announced its next hearing a few weeks from now on September 28th, though it remains unclear, including apparently to the committee itself, just what the agenda will be and whether other hearings may follow. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham introduced a bill providing for a nationwide ban on abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy, with some few exceptions, that landed with a thud in the Senate and the Republican caucus. Graham's bill aggravated the Republicans' complicated calculus over abortion and the Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade, issues that seem to be keeping the Democrats competitive or even slight favorites moving one week closer to the midterms. To try to make sense of these many moving parts and analyze where they fit in the broader picture of a divided government and a volatile electorate, we're really pleased to welcome three of the country's most knowledgeable commentators, and they are... Luke Broadwater, a congressional reporter in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times. He began his career at the Baltimore Sun, where he won the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for Local Reporting and the George Polk Award for Political Reporting. Luke's reporting in Baltimore led to traffic enforcement reforms and the passage of a state constitutional amendment redirecting casino revenue back to the state's public schools. This is his first time on Talking Feds. So pleased to welcome you, Luke. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. George Conway, not his first time, I'm happy to say, on Talking Feds, a prominent American attorney a contributing columnist at the Washington Post, a co-founder of the Lincoln Project, and a founding member of Checks and Balances, a group of conservative lawyers standing up for the rule of law. A seasoned Supreme Court advocate, George successfully argued the 2010 case Morrison versus National Australia Bank before the U.S. Supreme Court. George, thanks very much for returning to Talking Feds. Thanks for having me. And Jen Rogers, a CNN legal analyst, a lecturer at Columbia Law School, and an adjunct clinical professor at NYU Law School. Jen worked for many years in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, where she served as the chief of the Organized Crime Unit and the chief of the General Crimes Unit. She is a charter member of Talking Feds and a good friend. Jen, thank you so much for joining. Great to be here, Harry. All right, so a few things happened this week down in Mar-a-Lago land. I want to begin with a comment from Bill Crystal from last week's episode where he noted, you know, all these smarty pants lawyers that he's in conversation with has said, no way Judge Cannon could do this. It just couldn't write. And he, a non-lawyer, was saying, I mean, maybe, but it seems like stranger things have happened. Well, a stranger thing now has happened this week. And we have an opinion from Judge Cannon that just denies a motion for a stay. So let me just start with the question from Bill. Were you 
surprised that Cannon doubled down and didn't grant the stay. I was surprised. Listen, I guess you always want to think the best of people and you want to think that federal judges are going to do their jobs and decide matters based on the facts and the law before them. So I was very surprised when she granted the motion in the first place. And then when DOJ gave her a very reasonable, very narrow request, an opportunity to save it all and just walk back the ruling with respect to the hundred classified documents, I thought she would jump at it and she did not. So it's a terrible decision. We'll see what happens in the circuit, but yeah. Color me surprised. Mm -hmm. George, you and I, I don't know if you know this, we were on warring epithets at the same time. I think I used the word atrocity. You, I think, though, quoting Bill Barr, said hunk of shit or something like that as to the opinion. What's so friggin' terrible about this decision? I quoted Bill Barr, inestimable Bill Barr, or estimable as saying that the original motion filed by Trump's lawyers was a crock of shit, which it was on many levels. There basically was no support, legal support for the proposition that the search was illegal in any way. They didn't make that argument. They had showed no irreparable harm because the stuff mostly belonged to the government. And to the extent there were any personal items there, the personal items were also evidence that they're mixed in with the government materials, their evidence that he had possessed them and, and they're entitled to that too. And there just was just no basis for the motion. And to the extent there were attorney client privileges, they didn't really make a specific showing. And it was just a you know small tail wagging a very, very large classified dog. So it was a crock of shit, exactly as Bill Barr said. And what made this worse, what I said was the judge's opinion last night was worse than a crock of shit. And it's for the reason that Jen pointed out. I mean, they were giving her a way out, the Justice Department, by saying, listen, you can have your special master. Just don't block us from looking at the documents that are marked classified. And that makes perfect sense because there's no doubt that the documents that are not classified were at least at one point classified, that they're sensitive national security information. It doesn't really matter whether they're classified for purposes of the statutes that were cited in the search warrant affidavit. But at the same time, there's no question that the, the documents do not belong to Donald Trump. And if there was personal stuff in there, well, at some point he can get it back. But the fact that he's not entitled as a matter of law, as a member of the Presidential Records Act, to these documents means that he doesn't suffer any irreparable harm. There was no legal basis for it, and there was no basis for equitable relief. And then the Justice Department gave her a way out, and she didn't take it, as Jen points out. I mean, she had to go to incredible contortions to basically create factual and legal issues that don't exist. The Justice Department provided evidence that these materials were classified. Trump doesn't deny it. They provide evidence of obstruction. Trump doesn't have anything to say about that. Trump has offered no basis for why he has these documents. They didn't even assert, as Trump has asserted publicly, that the documents were declassified, you know, willy-nilly by his brainwaves or Karnak the Magnificent style. There was no basis whatsoever not to give the government what it needed. And on top of that, there's a the whole thing about her contention that somehow and I, I look, I'm not an expert. I never worked with classified material. You know, the closest I've been to a government lawyer is being as a law clerk. But even I can guess that the intelligence aspects of this investigation are in inextricably intertwined with the criminal aspects of the investigation. Because if you're a criminal investigator, you need to know how sensitive these materials were. And if you're on the counterintelligence side, you need to know what happened to the documents, which requires the criminal investigators to ask questions. You can't separate the investigation. It's like having an arson investigation. Are you going to have the police running around trying to figure out what's going on without talking to the fire experts? You can't do it. Or an airplane crash that might have been terrorism. You're going to have the FBI not work with aviation experts? It's crazy. She has no power to tell the government how to run its investigations. Why does one part of the executive branch get to do this and another part of the executive branch not get to do it and at the say-so of a federal judge? You know, I'm a member of the Federal Society. I'm still a member of the Board of Visitors of the Federal Society. And we're supposed to believe in separation of powers here? Where does it say that the executive power of the United States shall be vested in the United States district judge in some obscure division of the Southern District of Florida? It doesn't say that. Or let alone a special master. I just want to add a point 
to what George said, which is these three propositions that he just went over. Actually, when he says there's no basis, no one can dispute, there's no basis. And she actually didn't try to dispute that if these are classified documents, he has zero possessory interest. Now, what he had argued is, well, classified, maybe, but all we know is that the government says they're classified, which was gibberish, right? That's what it means for something to be classified. And then second, Trump had said, once again in the public sphere with Howard Hewitt, I would declassify it, but very pointedly, he won't make that argument in court where there would be sanctions for lying, but he said in his papers, nonsensically, well, maybe he might have done it. Now, you know, what a district court judge should do is put him on the stand, raise your right hand, or figure it out one way or another. But again, she let him slide without having to say anything and just said, well, maybe he declassified them. We have to find out. It wouldn't be appropriate. That was the only sort of legal reasoning. It wouldn't be appropriate to go forward without hearing from a special master. And I'll stop gassing on, too, with one final point, which is, yeah, maybe the worst violation of, of separation of powers was she had an undisputed affidavit really explaining why you cannot separate out into separate spheres the national intelligence and the criminal investigation. But as I read the opinion, she just said, well, they say it would be that, but I don't believe them. I can't take their word for it. It's an undisputed factor. Yeah. So it was so unjudicious in so many ways. I know I went over my allotted time just a couple <laughs> minutes ago, but I didn't practice criminal law the way Harry and Jennifer have. But I was always taught in litigation that if one side submits evidence and the other side does not, you have to find in favor of the side that actually submitted evidence, which was a form of the affidavit, the search warrant, and I don't get it. How do you, how do you, how do you find to the contrary when even there's no factual dispute. It's just, uh, I was just going to yeah. say, I'm sorry. Then we'll let poor Luke talk. But the other <laughs> no, thing that was so... Poor Luke. I'm with three lawyers. Yeah, no. <laughs> I know. We can't shut up. About this is, you know who else has no experience that's relevant to deciding this question? Judge Cannon, yeah. right? Yeah. She's an inexperienced judge. She rejects an amicus brief from former high-level Republican officials who are trying to explain to her some things about these matters. And she, she rejects let it them file as them. unhelpful, which is, as you all know, unheard of. I mean, you know, judges often ignore them, but they rarely refuse to accept them for filing. So she knows nothing about this. She was never a high-level Department of Justice official. We have no reason to believe she's ever worked with classified documents. And yet she feels within her rights to say, you know, I, I don't want to learn more about it. I don't care. This is about the plaintiff, the identity of the plaintiff, as she says very plainly in the last couple of lines of her order. And that's it. I don't trust the government and I have undisputed facts that I'm going to ignore. And that's how it's going to be. I mean, it's extraordinary. Luke, I want to ask you your thoughts about it, but I'd like to add a thing. You have the advantage of being the non-lawyer here. You can see the three of us, you know, our heads are exploding and anyone who believes in legal reasoning and the rule of law are like foaming at the mouth. Does it come through though? Do you think the American people have any kind of sense of this is way, way out there? Or is that the sort of thing that's just too fine grained for non-lawyers to really appreciate? Well, we did one story at the Times where I was legal experts like sounding off on a special master. I think it was called like outrageous or inexplicable or something. I forget what the headline was. And I think that was the best read story at the Times for the whole week. Like everyone read that story because I think people were trying to make sense of this thing. Like, is she being fair minded? Is she out there? But I think you're right. Most people are probably hearing special master. They're thinking something about the documents. They really want to know, is Trump going to be charged or not? And I think they could have some sense that this slows that down, right? Like this is standing in the way of justice, maybe. that's. I think that's what probably is getting out to the public. That's kind of my concern, too, is the practical implications of it. Like I'm on Capitol Hill most days talking to the senators and Congress people, and they're saying like, well, now we can't get our classified briefing. Now we can't get our damage assessment done. There was some belief at some point that she was going to let them do the damage assessment, but not the FBI, but the FBI is part of the group that does the damage assessment. So it didn't make any sense. And anyway, I don't think they can do that now. And the classified briefing's been pushed off. 
And so I guess I do have a question for the people who used to be federal prosecutors. How much does this hurt their investigation? Like if you have to wait three weeks or three months or, or whatever. Jen, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, look, the initial order was not clear at all. This second order, she tries to clarify the uses to which the government can put the documents. She effectively is saying you can't actually hold them and use them. You can't take them into the grand jury and read from them. You can't charge based on them, but you can still kind of know what you know from having seen them and proceed with your investigation. So it's still not entirely clear. I don't know that it damages the investigation piece of it so dramatically if ultimately they get them within the time that they would have needed to charge anyway. But here's my concern. So she's overseeing the special master. She's appointed Judge Deary, who is vastly more experienced. And I think now we can say conclusively a vastly better judge than Judge Cannon is. But she's overseeing this process because she appointed him. So what happens when Judge Deary in a couple of weeks has reviewed these 100 documents, has decided, duh, these documents are going back to the government. They are not going to Donald Trump. And Donald Trump then runs to Judge Cannon and says, no, no, this is all wrong. You know, he made the wrong decision. You need to reverse this decision and give us what we want, which is to throw these documents out of the case. And then what does Judge Cannon do? Is DOJ going to appeal that to the 11th Circuit? I mean, how much litigation are we getting in that's going to delay all of this well beyond the period in which Judge Deary went to make his decision. It'll probably be done in a couple of weeks, but we could be litigating months and months and months. And obviously, if they can't charge months and months and months down the road till it goes up and down Supreme Court 10 times, that is obviously really damaging to the investigation side of the House. And it's even worse because she has, again, without any reasoning, continued to open the more than open the door she has ordered him to review documents for executive privilege special masters don't do that they've never done that but more to the point there's no law for a guy like Derry to apply there actually is law out there that makes it clear that he could never have possessory interest in this because even if there was some theoretical basis because it's a criminal investigation, it's been settled that it would give ground. But Deary has no way to call balls and strikes on executive privilege documents. He'll take one and say, okay, looks like executive privilege to me. But then the question that she's left open with no legal standards to think about is, well, does he have some right to this or not? He'll make a call. Trump will oppose. And then what Jen says, you know, goes up and down and there's literally no law there. So it's fanciful to think that if this stays, it will be done by November 30th. It's a huge derailing of the whole case, not to mention if it's true that he has some interest in some of these 10,000 documents, then maybe that affects the criminal charge or investigation. Maybe it's not a crime. What about those? They go to the 11th Circuit and it's reversed. You know, this was a special action under Rule 41. If they say she shouldn't have acted and given him this extraordinary relief, isn't that sort of the end of the Rule 41 motion? And aren't we back to normal with Judge Reinhardt? Or does she still somehow, are her claws in the case forever and ever? No, I mean, I think it would be the end of it. I think there are different ways to end this. First of all, I think any of us, could go through the 100 classified documents and look at them and conclude these documents are marked classified. That's really the only issue. They're not necessarily executive privilege because it doesn't involve some kind of discussion with aides. It's just factual information being provided, not necessarily by people in the White House, but this is stuff coming from CIA, NSA, DOD. We don't know exactly, but this isn't executive privilege stuff. It's just this is stuff more classified, and it was the subject of the subpoena, and it was not produced. And if Judge Deary is doing his job, he should basically say to the Justice Department, give me the 100 do documents, or he'll come down to Washington and look at them, and then immediately issue a decision saying these documents should be turned over to the government. Now, that could move it. The other thing is that I've heard 
that the, the Justice Department really is going to go to the 11th Circuit today. That stay application is an easy, that's an easy grant. You're not taking out the whole special master. The 11th Circuit could just issue the stay that she declined to issue last night. And basically, that's the end of what really matters. Here. Yeah. Although they'll continue in the regime, but that's right. One thing about the skiff, though, when they go down to Washington and Derry does it, guess who else is in the room? Trump's attorneys having gotten a security clearance, so that's at least sort of a mucks up the works. But, I, mean, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what it how how that helps them. If the shit's classified, it's classified. It is what it is. So they get to see what it is. Well, he already saw what it was, and maybe even some foreign visitors who worked their way down to the storage room. I don't know. And they can still investigate who was in and out of the storage room. There's a lot they can still do. And, you know, the way they could shut this down, I was just thinking this the other day. I mean, it was part of the speculation of what the hell Trump was doing in Washington. Once they indict him in the District of Columbia, I don't see what business it is of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida yeah. to do any of this. And, and the fact of the matter is they're going to have to indict him, I believe. It's been... Over a month, maybe it's five weeks now since this search from Mar-a-Lago. August 8th. Yeah. They have not articulated anything close to a legal or factual defense to any of this. None. And you throw in there that this stuff is the most sensitive stuff you could possibly imagine. You throw in the volume. You throw in the fact that he didn't give it up the first time up voluntarily. And then he didn't give it up when he was subpoenaed. And then somebody lied on his behalf about whether or not all the stuff was there. And then they have witnesses basically saying there was more stuff, which was the basis of a search warrant. I don't see how they don't prosecute him. Well, uh, you also throw in the precedent. January 6th is a terrible event, but it's sui generis. But it's clear that anyone who's come close to doing what he did has been prosecuted. Well, I have an organized crime analogy. I defer to Jennifer on whether it works, but it's basically like, like you have this RICO investigation. You're investigating the five families. You know, you're trying to put together this massive RICO case, dozens of murders and loan sharking and this and all the other stuff. And all of a sudden you get a call from the NYPD and they say, hey, we just busted these guys loading up jewelry into a warehouse outside Kennedy Airport. And guess what? The capo de capo was at the wheel and helping load the stuff in. It's like, that's easy. He goes to jail. <laughs> you prosecute that case. Now, we may go back to the RICO case later, which would be the January 6th case in my metaphor. But why wouldn't you take that case and go with it? This is stolen property. He had the stolen property. He lied about the stolen property. I hate to say something's easy because it can always be made complex. But this is not a nickel and dime drug bust, but it's getting close. It's close as you're going to get for a former president of the United States. Luke, Jen, do you share George's feeling that it's A, easy, and B, a sort of foregone conclusion? I definitely think it's significantly easier than the January 6th case. When this came along, it was like, ooh, there's a nice, clean, much cleaner case for them to bring, much easier case for them to bring factually. And, you know, listen, if they were debating where to bring it between D.C. and Florida, I think their decision has been made for them. I mean, I think they don't want to go anywhere near the Southern District of Florida at this point. So I also think that they will at some point bring an indictment and it will be out of DC. It'll keep you busy, Luke. I mean, I think it was an easy case to to charge, right? The facts are already out there. It seems very clear that he mishandled classified documents and other people have been charged for doing much less with classified documents. You have a number of cases of criminal prosecutions in, in the past decade or so. But the question is, will they? And so I'm not asking you to predict about DOJ, I know. But but what about this notion of document storage case? As he just asserted yesterday, the country will go berserk. Is it one reason that people are emphasizing the easiness and the fact that other people have been charged in much less serious situations is to say there'd be a strong public justification rebutting any kind of accusation that it's all politics, et cetera. Do you see that? It would never be a walk on the beach, but does this case feel what prosecutors would call righteous? And does it feel like the kind of thing that the public would accept? If justice is going to do it, I think they would need to lay out how similar it is to previous cases. 
Everyone says that Trump's home got raided. It's unprecedented. It's never happened before for a president, which is true. But as someone who came up as a state and local reporter, yeah. I've seen a mayor get her house raided. I've seen governor's homes be searched. I've seen senators. I've seen Congress people. The FBI takes public corruption very seriously. And just because we've only had 45 presidents and none of them ever did anything bad enough to warrant a search of their house before, it shouldn't be that there's this one guy who like is untouchable, right? Like if he does public corruption, he, he you can't search his house, you can't charge him. It just seems un-American, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, it seems anathema to like every other FBI public corruption case, right? Like every other one. And many times in these cases, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know, but there'll be a plea deal where you can't run again, or you have to step down, or there's actually a political penalty for having broken some law. And it happens to mayors and governors and senators and people like that. Absolutely. That's a really, by the way, interesting prospect because he's a liar and who's going to stop him? He makes the deal and he, you know, that would be some pretty interesting con law, attorney Conway, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've seen so many cases like that at the lower levels. So that is how they handle things. But of course, would it create division? Yes. Would there be a lot of very angry people? Yes. So I think, of course, the Justice Department is, is weighing those things when deciding. But the answer is going to be the facts. At the end of the day, it's the facts. It was that search warrant that he asked for, basically, to be released, the search warrant application affidavit. That was the most devastating thing that happened to him. And this is going to be the speaking indictment to end all speaking indictments. I mean, if I were drafting this thing, it's going to be a long indictment, <laughs> and it is going to be full of facts. You got to lay it out. You can't do this conclusory in the district. You committed this and you just name the elements of the offense. No, you, you, it's going to be a long, long recitation and it's going to contain all the evidence and all the grand jury stuff, frankly. Luke, I want to move to the other broad continent of possible Trump criminal liability, January 6th. So we have the committee coming back into session. But there was this week the kind of suggestion from Thompson that whereas they've been arm's length to date, they will be sharing things more readily with the Department of Justice. It's been a little um, odd to me. You would think that each should want the other to succeed. What's been going on with the committee that they've been wanting to withhold the information they've developed from DOJ and what is prompting the change now if, in fact, there is a change? Well, yeah. I mean, the latest thing, and Benny Thompson has been kind of all over the place on this. He says one thing one day and then something else the next. I just talked to him yesterday about this, and he said, we're not going to give them anything until after we're done. Done, done. In December. Yeah, yeah. so done the report, done everything. So that's the latest thing he said. Now, that, that could change next week, but but that's the latest thing he said. And he had a number of reasons for this. One was just sort of, this was our work, not their work. It was sort of very like classic Washington bureaucratic territorialism. I do think reading between the tea leaves, the thing that they're concerned about, almost like a journalist or a book author, is saving their scoops, like saving uh -huh. their expenses for the hearings. Like I, that's kind of what I'm reading between the lines. Whereas we have to do a, one or two more hearings. We had to put out our report and we've gotten great ratings. They've been a big hit with the public. And part of that is because we have revelations, right? If we're just telling people things they already know, that's less interesting. And there's a belief on the committee that if they give everything to justice, all the 1000 transcripts, all their evidence and materials, all the text messages and the like, that eventually those will have to be given to defense attorneys hundreds of defense attorneys in all these cases. And that is essentially like releasing it publicly. Now that's kind of a selfish thing and it doesn't sound great for the committee because you would think they want to be lined up with justice. But several people told me yesterday, it's only going to be three more months. So they view it as like, we'll ultimately reach the same goal as them, but we want to make sure we can manage our material through the process until we're done with it. I mean, that's what you hear. But of course, as Jen will tell you, the defendants will not see these unless there's exculpatory information in there. The defendants won't see them until they're tried and there's actual testimony at trial by the people who are using them. It's going to be a lot more than three months. All right, back to the criminal side of things. We learned this week that Mark Meadows has coughed up at least what he gave to the January 6th committee 
to DOJ, and that's a lot of stuff. I do want to ask you, Jen, whether you think there's any serious prospect that the department would give him immunity. Yeah, I mean, I was actually kind of surprised when I saw the headlines and then read the article that he's only given over what he gave to the committee because there's a lot that he withheld. Of course, he's going to give what he gave to the committee. I mean, that stuff's out of the bag. What does he care about that? And there is some good stuff in there. But the better stuff, I almost can promise you, is what he held back under these questionable claims of executive privilege and so on. So they need to get at that stuff. Will they give him immunity or make him into a cooperator? Uh, Yeah, they might. I mean, I don't know that there's any single person who, if truly cooperative, would make a more effective witness because he was just there at the critical times. So is it worth it to flip someone like Meadows against Trump? Yeah, I think it is. So I think they would try to do that. We'll see what he does. He seems to be a self-preserving kind of a guy. So if it comes to that, then I think he would do it. The question is, are they, of course, going to have enough on him to compel him to flip? And that, you know, I don't think we know yet. George Terwilliger, his attorney, his first play would presumably be for immunity and not, you know, well, we'll charge you. And the different model of getting leverage is, you know, here's your 20 year sentence and maybe you can get it way, way down. So. If I can jump in there, it would not surprise me if the subpoena that he got was very broad. And remember that the committee hasn't shared anything with justice yet. So right. they don't have firsthand that all the text messages and stuff he gave them. So they had a prepared submission already. They may have just sent that over. So now they've given them all the same thing. What would prevent justice from coming back and saying, and what about everything else? It could be there's another step there in the process. Right. And, and if he says, well, that's executive privilege, when the committee didn't have the sort of strength or time to fight back, justice will say, uh-uh, U.S. versus Nixon says you have to give it over and it's been waived, see you in court. And he loses that. It takes some time, but their timeline is different. What do you think, George, about the most frightening or inculpatory witness for the former president there is? Yeah, Meadows would be key. And yeah. I I would grant him immunity. I'd make him queen for a day, at least to find out what to say. Tell us what that is, by the way. Well, I'll let you guys tell what queen for a day. Okay, queen for a day. He gets to come in and not be prosecuted and make a proffer. Yeah, basically say, if I were to give you a t- testify, this is what I'm going to tell you. And something's going on with this guy. Let's just take a step back. Yeah. A year ago, Last summer, he was at Mar-a-Lago bragging about the fact that he and the cabinet, the former cabinet or members of the former cabinet and other people associated with Trump were meeting to talk about 2024. And he was bragging about that. He was in the thick of it. He was in the thick of Trump land and uh, the potential campaign. This year, we haven't heard anything from him. He went dark. There was this thing down here in D.C., where Trump gave his first speech back in D.C. It was like a month or two ago. Meadows was nowhere to be found. Meadows is a weak guy. We see that in the evidence where he's telling one people, yeah, I'll talk him out of it. And he's telling these other people, yeah, we need to- Terrible chief of staff, right? Right, no, he he, he blows whichever way the wind goes. And for that reason, I agree with Jennifer. I don't think this guy wants to go to jail for Donald J. Trump. And whoever blows on him hardest and last is going to send him in the direction he's going to go. And right now, I think the Justice Department can do that. So for all we know, he didn't just produce the stuff that he produced at January 6th committee. That should have been produced a long time ago. Terwilliger would have no basis to resist on that. There may be a lot more going on here than we know about. And again, it's just his silence is deafening on this. I really agree. Oh, and one other thing. He's got a good lawyer, and he is weak, and that lawyer tells him, shut the hell up and don't see Trump. And he did. And unlike Trump, he'll follow because he wants to stay out of jail. Luke, let's close out here again back to the committee. So it seems pretty certain there's a hearing coming on the 28th. It's not clear if there'll be a series of them. It's not clear if the committee knows. What's our best current understanding of what's coming, both on the 28th and subsequent hearings? Sure, yeah. So they're actually meeting today to talk about this. So it's very much in flux. 
The goal is to have the next hearing on the 28th, as you said. I think initially they had hoped to do a substantial bit of that about cabinet level conversations about invoking the 25th Amendment against Trump. Mm -hmm. But as they brought in people, Pompeo was not really forthcoming with them. They got a lot of resistance. And I'm not sure they got enough material out of those interviews that last month to do a whole hearing about that. Mm -hmm. So that, that may only be a sliver. I think they're going back to the drawing board and coming up with other ideas, who, who to invite in. I've heard different names tossed around. They have not yet reached out to any witnesses for this hearing. They typically do that like a week beforehand. Uh, and then if the person doesn't want to come in, they'll hit them with a subpoena to try to make them come in. So, look, we haven't heard anything from the blue team investigation about capital yeah. security. They could do something on that if they wanted to. They've got a big submission from the Secret Service just last week that supposedly has radio talk recordings of that. They've Microsoft Teams messages from yeah. the Secret Service. So it's possible that could be part of it. But it's really in flux right now. And let me ask you this. Do you have the sense, as you say, they've been blockbuster hearings, successful, et cetera, but you're really there day to day. How much intra-committee friction do you sense there is either jockeying for the limelight or real strategic disagreements? Are they rowing, you know, in the same direction relative for government, of course, or not so much? Well, much more so than any normal committee. I mean, mm -hmm. they're on the same page. There are some disagreements about which subpoenas to send, which should be the topic of the hearings. Should this be one hearing or two hearings? They do have a lot of stuff just from the cutting room floor. Like their hearing on domestic extremism was initially five hours long and they cut it down to two. So they could potentially just use that for a hearing. They have raised this standard for themselves where they have to produce blockbuster hearings, right? So if they just do a hearing that rehashes things we already know, no one wants to do that. And so I do think they're a little bit worried right now about this hearing not being as good as some of the others. Because like yesterday, no one wanted to talk to me. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would have like three or four of them in there. <laughs> you know, not today. So like they, I think once they have a plan, they'll be much, much more eager to talk. But I get the sense there's a little bit of anxiety about pulling this hearing off. And they're competing with the stolen documents investigation, yes, which has right. been completely jaw-dropping. It's going to be hard to top what they already did and what's happening and probably going to happen based on the Mar-a-Lago documents investigation. So it might be just best for them to just focus on putting together their final report. Maybe one last hearing if they got some good stuff. But they've created a record for history. It's great. And we all know now whether there's a causal effect or in part, I don't know. But the, the Justice Department is basically exploring every angle of January 6th now. They're off to the races. Yeah, it's not like a few months ago, right? When it it's was... not like a few months ago where the January 6th committee seemed like it was the only game in town on January 1st. Well, and in some ways, look at the subpoenas that are going out. It's the same people the committee subpoenaed and the same yeah. questions. Like they're the, very much following that roadmap. I mean, them. if you're Liz Cheney and Chairman Thompson, you might think, you know, we've basically done our job here. And I'll say one more thing on that, which is December's going to come mighty fast. They want to put out a provisional report in October. It's closer to midnight, I think, than many people appreciate. It's time now for our sidebar feature. We're going to replay one from way back near the beginning of Talking Feds because it's so germane today. It's on classified materials and how they become classified. So obviously, it's an issue that is front and center in the current Mar-a-Lago investigation and broader brouhaha. And to read it, I'm thrilled to welcome Sandra Bernhard. Sandra Bernhard got her big break in 1983 in the movie King of Comedy, which coincided with my big break as a production assistant on the same film, meaning I got her and others on the production, which was star-studded coffee and drove them around. But she was very kind, and she actually hung out some with the kids, my peers and me, and I remember vividly going to see her do stand-up in the village and also going with her to the famous fire department concert at Bonds of The Clash, to whom Scorsese gave bit parts in the movie as, quote, street scum, close quote. See if you can find them next time you watch King of Comedy, which I highly recommend. 
Okay, since then our careers diverged a bit as I became a lawyer and she became a world famous comedian, actress, and musician. Well known for Roseanne, hilarious appearances on David Letterman and some fantastic one woman shows like Without You, I'm Nothing. So I give you Sandra Bernhard on classified materials. What are the restrictions on and penalties for leaking classified material? In the United States, classified information is information that a federal government agency has designated for limited or restricted dissemination because of its potential to harm national security or foreign relations. Classification law exists in statutes and agency regulations, but the classification system has, since the 1940s, been primarily a product of executive orders. President Obama's 2009 Executive Order 13526, which revoked and replaced prior classification orders, provides the current classification framework. The order sets out three levels of sensitivity, top secret, secret, and confidential. This division is based on the expected degree of damage to national security that an unauthorized access would pose. Many government employees and contractors need access to classified information to do their jobs. Government agencies grant them security clearances to allow for such access. For example, someone who holds a top secret clearance may lawfully access information designated top secret, secret, and confidential. The government has different ways to enforce the prohibition against restricted dissemination of classified material, depending on the seriousness of the breach. At the least serious, it can impose disciplinary action or revoke the security clearances of employees who mishandle classified information. Next, several studies impose civil fines or other penalties for mishandling or leaking classified information. At the most serious, there are criminal penalties for people whether or not they are government employees who collect or leak classified information intentionally to harm national security interests. For example, promoting the success of military enemies. The most notable among them is the broad-reaching 1917 Espionage Act. Prosecutors use the Espionage Act to charge both Edward Snowden and Pentagon Papers whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg. And several counts in Chelsea Manning's court-martial charge sheet incorporated the act. Other criminal information security laws include the Intelligence Identities Protection Act, which imposes up to a 15-year prison term for the intentional leaking of information identifying a covert agent. That was the law that prosecutors used for the investigation of the leaking of former CIA officer Valerie Plame's identity, which led to the conviction of Vice Presidential aide Louis Scooter Libby for lying to investigators and obstruction of justice. For Talking Feds, I'm Sandra Bernhard. Thank you so much to Sandra Bernhard for explaining that important concept. You'll be able to see Sandra in the new season of American Horror Story, which will be broadcast this fall. All right, it is now time for a spirited debate brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thank you, Harry. In today's spirited debate, we discuss adding the right amount of water to a glass of whiskey without turning it into a whiskey river. The thought of adding water to any golden brown whiskey might bring tears to the eyes of some whiskey drinkers. But for others, adding a few drops of water to your glass has its merits and actually improves and enhances the flavor. The phrase open up refers to the release of the extra flavor you taste by adding those drops of water. And here's a little bit of science that helps reinforce that theory. When water is added to whiskey, it releases the guaiacol, which is partially responsible for the smoky and spicy flavor. When guaiacol is released, it rises to the surface so the aromas are more easily noticeable, allowing your palate to experience the smell and flavor that imparts on the drink. And while there's really no right or wrong way, some say adding a splash of water brings out the best in your glass of whiskey. Of course, going overboard with the water has diminishing returns, watering down the whiskey and proving once again that moderation almost always wins. So the next time you're thirsting for a little experimenting of your own, stop into your local Total Wine & More for a whiskey selection that suits every budget. 
And that's a scientific fact. So find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine and More. Cheers. Thanks to our friends at Total Wine and More for today's A Spirited Debate. All right, I wanted to take a few minutes away from Donald Trump, if you guys can stand it, <laughs> to talk about a, a We've pretty We've been trying jarring, to do that for four years. I mean, yeah. <laughs> political development of the, well, not political policy. So the post Dobbs landscape continues to get, I would say, bleaker and bleaker for women and doctors. So we had the first new abortion ban since Dobbs took effect in Indiana and another coming in West Virginia. But I wanted to talk about this thunderbolt, it seems to me, within the political world and the country by Lindsey Graham, who introduced a bill for a national 15-week abortion ban, with some exceptions. But it appeared to take leadership by surprise and expose these fault lines in the GOP. What was his calculation acting obviously without the approval of leadership. What's he thinking? And of course, he's just doubled down since then. And is it a blunder? Any thoughts on that? Well, I'll start it. Lindsey Graham famously once said his main goal is to be relevant. And so I think, I yeah. think in its simplest form, it's just, it's just that. <laughs> like he saw a chance for himself to be in the limelight and took it. Susan B. Anthony organization was shopping around this bill. They wanted a senator to put it in. They believed that there was sort of an absence of consensus in the Republican position, and they wanted something they thought the party could rally around. And Mitch McConnell has been like, don't touch this thing. Don't talk about it. But, yeah. Right. But Lindsey jumped in there and they're all running away from it. I mean, a couple of them joined it. I think Rubio and maybe a couple others co-signed on to the bill, but most of them are saying, leave it up to the states. Don't touch this thing. Like, it's created a very much a sticky situation among the Republicans on, on the Hill. I mean, whatever happened to federalism here, right? Alito's opinion was we return it to the people, and the people means Lindsey Graham? Yeah, it, it's completely incomprehensible. I don't understand the, the rationale for it or the politics of it at all. One of the points about Roe was it created a 50 state wide rule that bound every state in an area that was traditionally subject to regulation by the states, family matters, medical licensing, all that kind of thing. It's just, you know, there are 50 states and, and different states do things in a different way. And the guy that Roe v. Wade was, there was a massive liberalization wave politically in the states where abortion was being legalized in many places. And, and Roe, weirdly, one of its perverse effects is just the Ginsburg noted once, it was to stop that dead in its tracks. And one of the criticisms the conservatives always had was, you know, this was a matter for the states, and now they want to take it away. And then politically, I don't understand it. They're getting their asses kicked politically in the polls because all of a sudden the dog caught the car, and now they have people pursuing extreme legislation in various states that turns off even diehard Republicans who thought that Roe was too lenient. And I, I just don't understand the politics of it. And I think it would have made more sense for Lindsey Graham instead of proposing 15 weeks as a ceiling and basically cutting off abortion rights in places like New York and California and everywhere in between, doing the opposite and basically saying at a minimum you get 15 weeks to have an abortion, you know, like basically what's the rule is in Western Europe with a lot with various exceptions. That politically would have made much more sense for the Republican Party. Even though, again, it's it's hypocritical. A floor because, rather than a ceiling, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A floor of rights rather than a ceiling because it would expand rights in some of these states where it's become very controversial and, and the Republicans stand to lose trouble, especially as demographic change occurs in places like Texas. That would logically have made more sense, although it's still, again, inconsistent with the proposition that the states are supposed to decide this. And, you know, what's the constitutional basis for Congress? At least they think conservatives are really going to make the Commerce Clause argument that this is a regulation of interstate commerce. Yeah. Wh what about <laughs> yeah. that NYU Columbia Law Prof? Do you, you, <laughs> do you see any basis for federal power here? Oh, God. I'm, okay. There's <laughs> nothing that's happened in the wake of Dobbs that 
that's good for for anyone here. I mean, this is just an unmitigated disaster. I mean, I look, I was reading that this is designed just to give Republicans choices, right? You can either be the state's rights guy if that's what you want to be. You can be the Lindsey Graham national ban guy if you want to be for your election, you know, whatever makes sense where you're running in the midterms. I don't know whether that's an effective political strategy or not. I don't know if that's what was behind it or not. But I mean, I don't know if you have a bill like that that relies on the Commerce Clause and says that this is what the federal government is doing and then that's challenged. I mean, what does Alito say about that? He just told us it was all up to the states. We'll see. You know, I just want to add one very quick thing about Lindsey Graham. I am no political analyst or pundit, but he just seems to me to be 80 percent of the time at least relatively thoughtful. And then he has this like Mr. Hyde meanness that he seems almost artificially to kick into gear and just become this snarling guy, I think, of the Kavanaugh hearings. And this is mean, Lindsay. All right, we are out of time except for one minute for our final Talking Five feature where we take a question from a listener and each of us has to answer in five words or fewer. And today's question is, so <laughs> Mike Lindell of My Pillow has been broadening his product line. It's not just pillows anymore. He's branched out into socks and sheets and slippers. What should his next new product be? Five words or fewer, please, guests. My orange jumpsuit. <laughs> the most comfortable orange jumpsuit ever made. I'm going to go in a different direction with my voting machine manipulation software. <laughs> Is that five words? I think so. Okay. Mushroom and Swiss burgers. Oh, a Hardy's reference. Oh, Hardy's. Yeah, and kind of steals my thunder too, because I'm going with my all polyester, zero calorie hamburger. All right. We are unfortunately out of time. Thank you so much to Luke, George, and Jen. And thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts. And please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. You can also now subscribe to us on YouTube, where we are posting full episodes, talking books, and bonus video content. Or follow us on Twitter at Talking Feds Pod. And if you like, think about subscribing to us, please, on Patreon, where we post each week one-on-one interviews with important authors of provocative new articles and other original content. You may have noticed Talking Feds has hardly any commercials, one most weeks. Other comparable podcasts have maybe 10. And we do that in an effort to make Talking Feds a better listening experience for all of you. So we don't follow the typical advertising business model, meaning we don't get much revenue that way. So Patreon is, in addition, we hope, to good value. You can go there and check it out. Patreon.com slash Talking Feds to see what we've got there. And if the spirit moves you to support the show and its many fewer interruptions for commercials. By the way, in addition to the one-on-one discussions there, you will also, as a Patreon member, be able to attend monthly live Q&As with me, which we do exclusively for supporters. Submit your questions to talkingfeds.com slash contact whether it's for Talking Five or general questions about the inner workings of the legal system for our sidebar segments. Thanks for tuning in, and don't worry, as long as you need answers, the Feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Olivia Henriksen, sound engineering by Matt McArdle. Rosie Don Griffin and David Lieberman are our contributing writers. Production assistants by Laurel Feldner, Kalena Tano, David Emmett, and Emma Maynard. Thanks very much to the great Sandra Bernhard for explaining classified documents. Our special gratitude, as always, to the amazing Philip Glass, who graciously lets us use his music. Talking Feds is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later. <laughs>